preocupado el presidente anaranjado Viendo que las elecciones las perdió Solicita a los que le hacen los mandados Que se apuren pues la fiesta terminó Y mirando que se va a acabar el varo Han formado un titingo Se han negado a abandonar la Casa Blanca A la silla del despacho se amarró Los pelitos que le quedan los arranca Pataleando por la rabia que le dio y mirando a Cuba con sus patas blancas, de cabeza se tiró. El que tenga confusión que se confunda, el que quiera claridad que venga a ver. La jugada no es compleja ni profunda, está claro cómo quieren proceder. Son lo falta que nosotros nos dejemos, y eso no va a suceder. Con la conga de los hoyos no te metas No te metas, no te metas Cuba viva sin que nadie la someta No te metas, no te metas ¡Ah! Mi tierra linda, mi cubanía Mi bandera se respeta No te metas, no te metas De La Habana pa' Santiago Defiende lo tuyo cubano Que no te metas con mi tierra, que mi Cuba se respeta. Se respeta, se respeta. Soy el mambi que aún vive con el machete en la mano. Se respeta, se respeta. No, 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 no. ¿Qué me importa si comenta? No te metas, no te metas. ¿Y dónde vengo yo? Estamos listos para. Tiene miedo, tú conmigo no te metas. No te no. Metas, no te metas. Hey. Oye, eso que tome alegría te molesta. No te metas, no te metas. Porque tú me conoces bien en toda mi faceta. No te metas, no te metas. Que no tenemos miedo, sal de ahí, no abra esa gaveta. Okay, we're live. Oh no, where did you go? <laughs> we are live on the stream. <laughs> Should we wait a couple of minutes for people to tune in? No, they were already. There's like 10 people watching. Oh, sweet. Why are you froze? Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining us live. My name is Sheldon Tenorio. I'm from Kibo Pueblo. I'm here with the uh, New Mexico and City Brigade Committee, as well as the Pueblo Action Alliance here in Antigua Territory. Um, only in the Berkeley, you like to introduce yourself. Greetings. My name is Onya Sanu. I am a member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. And I'm also on the New Mexico Organizing Committee of the Events and Events Brigade. Hi, everybody. 
Roberto, you have no sound. There we go. You hear me now? Yes. Okay, my name is Roberto Raibal. I'm with the Southwest Organizing Project, and I've been working with the New Mexico Vents and Evans Brigade Committee since uh, 1976. When I went to the uh, International Festival of Youth and Children back in 76 in Cuba. And I've been there a number of times with the Vents and Evans Brigade. And, uh, we've seen a lot about the, the, the role of the women in the revolution in Cuba. And this film is going to be really good. It's going to show a lot. And uh, welcome, everybody. Glad you could join us. Thanks, Sir Pedro. Awesome. Thank you all. Ooh, again, my name is Sheldon Tenorio. Welcome to uh, regular scheduled programming from the New Mexico DV. We do this every last Monday of every month. Um, you can catch us on this page and on live streams and Zoom meetings as well. There's also, we have an email too that you can reach us at and um, just learn more and figure out ways um, to be engaged as well and how to support or how to even help us fundraise or help us think of different ways to continue uh, keeping us all ready. Uh, again, uh, the New Mexico DV, um, being able to organize and be a part of it has been about a year, a year and a half or two coming up. Um, and the opportunity came about a little bit after getting to travel to Cuba. Um, and that's basically how our community the next to be formed. Um, big shout out to Julia as well, uh, who's also part of the mix to be part of Public Action Lines as well as our Lines Director. And right now, I want to just take the time to acknowledge the fact um, that we are on Tiwa territory, um, which is so called Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, the land occupies beautiful waters um, and lands and people <clears throat> here in the territory. And just want to acknowledge the fact that that's the lands that we are on, that we are calling, calling in from today. And if you don't know what regions or territories, original people's territories you're in, um, occupy as well, I highly suggest <laughs> and highly recommend that you find out. And then you can go further and uplift with people as well in those areas programming, initiatives, organizations, doing amazing work in those territories too, as well. So again, we do this every last Wednesday, every month. Um, I'll be able to speak a little bit more about the video we're going to show you all here in a minute. And can I add something, Sheldon? Sure. Can I add something? I'd also like to say uh, the Vents at Emerson Brigade National has been sending people to Cuba on the Vents at Emerson Brigade since 1969. And, um, I had the opportunity to go on the 50th uh, anniversary contingent, which was fantastic. And this year, we haven't heard anything about a brigade going. We'd also really like, like to show you what's going on in Cuba and hope that you uh, can get the interest and, and are interested in going to Cuba with us. Hopefully, we can we'll start sending people again next year. Like I said, I doubt it's going to happen this year. But keep your, your ears open, your eyes open, and uh, you know just watch our show because we'll definitely be sharing information once we start uh, organizing for visit and we get to send people because uh, it's, uh, it's uh, an incredible opportunity to see a, a, a revolution, a live revolution happening on a daily basis and people living there you know, under that revolution. So I would highly encourage people to, to go to Cuba whenever you can, whenever you get the opportunity. There's other opportunities besides the Vincent Lewis Brigade, but to me the brigades you know, we're, we're nationally known in Cuba. We've been going for so long, but there's a lot of respect for events in this brigade, and you know, I hope you would go with us. So, but, so keep your eyes and ears open. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. Thank you for that, Roberto. Yeah, definitely, again, being a part of this coalition, being a part of the work that we do in the territory as well. It's very important uh, to continue relationships, build those relationships. Solidarity is a key component, and exchanging what works, what hasn't worked, what can we do, what knowledge can we share, what knowledge can we exchange, cultures even can exchange and really help and continue to build that world that we all want to be part of, that we all want to live in. Um, so yeah, the opportunity just again, like Roberto said, keep your eyes and ears open. Um, yeah, 
That's all I really wanted to share right now. Again, thank you for tuning in. I'll pass it over to Omi to introduce the video. Cool. Thanks for that really great intro, Roberto and Sheldon. Um, so as Sheldon mentioned, and Roberto also briefly mentioned, today um, for our political education on Cuba, we want to talk about Cuban women and the role they played in the Cuban Revolution. So obviously when you hear about the Cuban Revolution, you hear about Che, you hear about Fidel, you hear about St. Fagos, everybody's going off video. So let me just show myself. I wonder if it's going to work if I, hold on, what did I do? What did I do? Hi, okay, cool. <laughs> uh, so obviously when you hear about the Cuban Revolution, you usually hear about um, Fidel, San Diego, uh, Che, and all uh, Raul. And, you know, these men were certainly very important to the development of the Cuban Revolution. They certainly played their role in world history, and we honor them. But it's also important to understand that, like, no revolution is won um, with just one portion of the population, meaning just the men. Every revolution that has been fought worldwide was successful because it organized all sectors of society across genders, which means women played a leading role in revolutionary struggles against the capitalism and imperialism all over the world, including in, in Cuba. And for those of us who are engaged in the work of building revolution right now, for those of us who are engaged in the work of struggling against patriarchy and for the liberation of women and people who are oppressed by patriarchy, we have to do the work of uplifting our sisters in the struggle who put in the work to liberate themselves and to liberate the island of Cuba and to liberate the oppressed peoples all around the world. And so in order to do that work this month, we are going to show y'all a panel discussion featuring the Federation of Cuban Women. The Federation of Cuban Women was a revolutionary, or is, it still exists, is a revolutionary organization made up of Cuban women that is struggling uh, for gender liberation and against patriarchy on the island. It was founded in August 23rd, 1960. Before the Cuban Revolution, women made up 5% of the workforce in Cuba. Today, thanks to the work of the Federation of Cuban Women, they are almost half of Cuba's workforce. They are the majority of judges, lawyers, scientists, technical finance, health, and public service workers. They are also more than half of Cuba's international medical volunteers. Um, so during the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen Cuba sending doctors all around the world, sending medicine all around the world. And half of the doctors, more than half of the doctors that Cuba is sending to fight COVID-19 around the world are women, 53.2%. So uh, women have played a leading role in the development of the Cuban Revolution during the armed struggle and after the armed struggle, the Federation of Cuban Women is the organization that is leading that work, that is on the forefront of that work. And so we are very excited to show you this panel discussion that was organized by Code Pink, an anti-imperialist organization here in the United States, featuring Teresa Amaral Boo, who is the General Secretary of the Federation of Cuban Women, as well as a number of other anti-imperialist uh, revolutionary organizers who are also women. So without further ado, I'm going to play the video, and I hope that y'all enjoy Philippa Harvey and I'm on the executive of the National Education Union um, and also I'm the currently the chair of the TUC Women's Committee. So I'll be chairing this meeting tonight as well as the speakers that you'll see and hear from tonight this, in this meeting. We also have Ryan from the Cuba Solidarity Campaign hosting the meeting. So if there are any technical issues that um, come up this evening, he may just suddenly appear on your screen. Hopefully it should all go smoothly and we should have a fantastic meeting in front of us this evening. We should also have a few uh, time for a few questions at the end of the uh, meeting after we've he heard from all our speakers, but we will uh, be finishing by eight o'clock this evening um, and uh, by which time hopefully it'll be slightly cooler than it already is this evening. Um, so firstly I'd like to thank you all for joining us uh, tonight. We have participates, participants via the meeting, the Zoom meeting that uh, we, I can see in front of me here this evening. And others are watching live by YouTube at the moment too. 
including our friends from FMC in Cuba. So welcome to you all, uh, especially everyone joining from Cuba. Um, we, I'm waving to you all the way over in Cuba, and I'm sure if they can see the rest of us, we are all waving to you as well. Um, I'd also like to welcome the Cuban ambassador, Her Excellency Barbara Montalvo Alvarez, who's joining us on Zoom. And we'd like to extend our congratulations on, and solidarity to the FMC on their 60th anniversary. Um, congratulations and uh, solidarity to you all. The Federation of Cuban Women is just a few months younger than the Cuban Revolution itself and was the first mass organizations, was one of the first mass organizations established by the new government. With its first president, Vilma Espin, at its helm, it spearheaded equality programs and transformed the lives of women in Cuba. It genuinely was a revolution within a revolution. Next year, next week, uh, on the 23rd of August, we mark the 60th anniversary of the Federation of Cuban of Cuba Women. And uh, the CSC had planned to have a delegation from the FMC come to the UK uh, in September to take part in a nationwide speaking tour. Now, unfortunately, we've had to delay this due to coronavirus. So I'm really delighted that our first contribution tonight will be from Teresa Amaral Bue who is the General Secretary of the Federation of Cuban Women, as well as a member of the Cuban National Assembly and the Council of State. It's important to point out here that Teresa's contribution is via a video interview that she recorded especially for us. Now, unfortunately, she can't join us through Zoom because the US blockade of Cuba means that Zoom isn't available to Cubans, which is just another example of how this policy impacts on all areas of Cuban life. The clip that we are going to play is 12 minutes uh, long. It's an, it's an extract of a longer message that she's recorded for us. The full recording will be up on the CSC YouTube channel later this week. And if you want to see the whole interview, you can go and visit the uh, YouTube channel later on this week. So uh, we are now going to watch that uh, interview. Teresa Marella Bobue, Secretaria General de la Federación de Mujeres Cubanas. La Federación de Mujeres Cubanas es una organización eh, no gubernamental que funciona en nuestro país y que funciona además con respaldo constitucional, porque el artículo 14 de la Constitución de la República establece que el Estado tiene la obligación de respaldar el funcionamiento de nuestra organización y de otras que como nosotras también son organizaciones no gubernamentales que tienen eh, iniciativa legislativa y que tienen también iniciativa de reforma en nuestra constitución, es decir, que son respaldadas por eh, la legislación en Cuba. Pero tenemos que decir que la Federación de Mujeres Cubanas como organización surgió de la voluntad de las mujeres cubanas, la voluntad de las mujeres cubanas que al triunfo de la revolución quisieron organizarse en una sola organización. Y fue así como más de 200 organizaciones que existían en aquel momento de mujeres en el país pidieron a través de algunas de ellas a nuestra querida Vilma Espín, en aquel momento guerrillera, en aquel momento combatiente del ejército rebelde, especialmente del segundo frente también en la clandestinidad, le planteó al comandante en jefe, a nuestro querido Fidel Castro, que las mujeres querían hacer una organización de mujeres. Y Fidel eh, valoró como muy revolucionario ese momento en que las mujeres querían hacer esa organización. Y a partir de ese momento se desplegó todo un trabajo en las comunidades para organizar la Federación de Mujeres Cubanas. Y es el 23 de agosto de 1960 que finalmente quedó constituida oficialmente nuestra organización. Repito, una organización con un amplio poder de convocatoria. Para nosotras hay dos fortalezas que son determinantes. Una, nuestras federadas, que es como le decimos en Cuba a las miembros de esta organización, que son personas mayores de 14, mujeres mayores de 14 años y que por voluntad propia quieran ingresar eh, a la organización. Ya hoy podemos decir que se 
60 años después tenemos una integración del 91,7%. Es decir, de todas las mujeres mayores de 14 años en Cuba, adolescentes, jóvenes, el 91,7% han decidido por su propia voluntad ser federadas. Por tanto, esa es, yo diría que la fortaleza más importante que tenemos como organización. Pero tenemos otra gran fortaleza y es la manera en que estamos organizadas. Yo creo que para cualquier país tener organizadas a las mujeres como una fuerza decisiva es muy importante, pero estar organizadas además a nivel de comunidad es otra de las grandes fortalezas. Nosotras contamos con 81.000 organizaciones de base a nivel de comunidad y con 14.000 bloques, es como se llama la estructura, que es una estructura intermedia entre las organizaciones de base y los comités municipales con los que también contamos. Como organización tenemos objetivos que son eh, por donde realizamos todos nuestros contenidos de trabajo. ¿Cuál es el primer objetivo de nuestra organización? La defensa de la revolución cubana. Porque la, la defensa de la revolución como un programa de igualdad. Porque si en la revolución cubana, las cubanas no, no hubiéramos alcanzado la posición que hoy tenemos. Porque fue precisamente la revolución la que comenzó a cambiar el concepto de lo femenino en nuestro país. Y fue la revolución la que se propuso como primera meta eliminar la discriminación a la que estaban sometidas las mujeres en Cuba. Ese es nuestro objetivo, eh, uno de nuestros principales objetivos. El otro objetivo, por supuesto, tiene que ver con la igualdad. La igualdad como proyecto de vida, como principio del Estado cubano, recogido también y refrendado por la Constitución de la República, es nuestro propósito. La educación de las mujeres, la educación de la familia en esa cultura de igualdad que se viene ganando en la sociedad porque no basta con las leyes, no basta eh, con los programas, con las políticas públicas si no trabajamos en la educación de nuestras mujeres. Y para ese trabajo educativo con nuestras mujeres, para que eleven su autoestima, es que contamos con estas organizaciones de base y con más de 400.000 activistas, porque somos una organización que trabajamos con activismo. Lo que tenemos es activismo. Y esas mujeres, es decir, que lo hacen de manera voluntaria, de manera eh, eh, por necesidad de ellas mismas de querer contribuir, de querer aportar. Nosotros y nuestra presidenta por siempre, Vilma Espí, siempre eh, reconocemos que somos, eh, que hemos sido además de beneficiarias de la obra de la revolución, también somos protagonistas. Porque en la misma ha sido un proceso digamos dialéctico, en la misma manera en que la revolución nos aportó derechos, oportunidades, posibilidades, nosotras también aportamos a la revolución con esa capacidad transformadora que tenemos las mujeres y con esa, las mujeres cubanas tenemos también una capacidad de resistencia y de imponernos ante las dificultades que hemos tenido, por ejemplo, eh, para las mujeres cubanas nada ha sido fácil porque el bloqueo económico impuesto por el gobierno de Estados Unidos ha sido eh, la mayor violación de los derechos humanos a la que hemos estado sometidas las mujeres cubanas. Y eso tiene un reflejo práctico en la vida cotidiana, en la vida de cada familia, en cada mujer. Y pudiéramos poner muchos ejemplos, sobre todo en las condiciones actuales, sobre todo ahora en el enfrentamiento a la pandemia estamos eh, enfrentando un bloqueo que no es el bloqueo que conocíamos de hace eh, 60 años, es un bloqueo mucho más recrudecido, mucho más cruel, es, es un bloqueo que abarca ya, que sobrepasa eh, la situación comercial, financiera, económica, es una agresión también a la subjetividad de las personas. Eh, ahí están los ejemplos desde el punto de vista material, como por ejemplo, las situaciones y las limitaciones que tenemos en el sector de la salud. Nosotros tenemos un programa importante en Cuba, que es el programa de eh, reproducción asistida. Tenemos centros de alta tecnología y tenemos más de mil parejas infértiles que quieren tener y que forma parte de su proyecto tener hijos. Sin embargo, el país no puede acceder a reactivos y equipamientos de alta eh, 
tecnología de primera generación porque precisamente el bloqueo nos lo está impidiendo. Pero tenemos también la situación, digamos, por ejemplo, de los alimentos. Cuba tiene que salir a comprar sus alimentos a otros continentes, a otros muy, en lugares muy distantes, pagando el flete y pagando todo lo que eso representa y además con el riesgo de que cuando esos productos lleguen pudieran correr eh, algún peligro de, de, de que estén en mal estado o algo así a partir precisamente de ese cruel bloqueo a lo que estamos siendo sometidos que no es solamente en la salud, no es solamente en la educación que es también en el sector empresarial, en, el, en los medicamentos ¿Cuántos medicamentos hoy escasean en Cuba? Y, ese, y esa situación es debido fundamentalmente a que tenemos que adquirir materias primas que proceden del mercado de Estados Unidos y como está prohibido que todo producto que tenga hasta un 10% de componentes norteamericanos eh, tiene que, nosotros no lo podemos adquirir, así hubo que paralizar eh, eh, aviones que teníamos contratados con otros países afectando la transportación de nuestro pueblo internamente y también hacia otros países. La migración, por ejemplo, es otro de los elementos eh, que decía que sobrepasa a veces lo comercial, lo financiero y tiene que ver con la subjetividad porque muchas de nuestras familias no pueden unirse, no pueden eh, verse, no pueden compartir momentos de alegría o de tristeza porque se lo impiden, porque tienen que ir a terceros países, porque cerraron las oficinas consulares en Cuba y entonces nuestro pueblo tiene que ir a otros países a poder, a, para poder hacer los trámites de, de visado. Eh, ahora la misma agresión que están teniendo contra nuestro personal de la salud, eh, de, que desinteresadamente Cuba ha prestado ayuda a otros países del mundo y, y ha sido siempre una vocación humanista de nuestro pueblo. Siempre ha sido así. Podemos mencionar, por ejemplo, en el año 60, triunfando la revolución prácticamente, en el momento en que se creó nuestra organización, ya Cuba brindó ayuda solidaria cuando el terremoto de Chile en el año 60, y ahí fueron mujeres nuestras federadas ya, o fueron mujeres a compartir, a, a brindar su ayuda solidaria. Pero también lo hemos dicho en otros momentos, y recientemente, eh, la, la OMS, la Organización Mundial de la Salud, le otorgó el premio de la salud a nuestra brigada Henry Rich. Esa brigada, por ejemplo, en este momento, está compuesta por un 61% de nuestras mujeres. Y eso tiene mucho que ver con esa vocación humanista, desinteresada, altruista, que está incorporada en nuestra manera de actuar. Entonces, es muy duro escuchar las acusaciones y las ofensas que le hacen a nuestro pueblo, sobre todo a nuestras mujeres, porque así lo sentimos nosotros. ¿Verdad? Yo quería específicamente agradecer a todos los movimientos de mujeres y a la solidaridad de Gran Bretaña con nuestro país por todas las muestras de cariño, de respeto, de solidaridad que han tenido para con nuestro pueblo, específicamente para con nuestra organización, por nuestro 60 aniversario, eh, las veces que han apoyado y han respaldado al pueblo, porque realmente es al pueblo cubano, en las votaciones que se hacen en la ONU por el bloqueo y si hemos podido eh, vencer siempre al imperialismo en esa eh, votación que muchas veces es eh, por parte de ellos traicionera, no, si hemos vencido ha sido precisamente por esa solidaridad, por lo que se lo agradecemos infinitamente ese apoyo, ese respaldo, ahora mismo estamos teniendo un apoyo y un respaldo, unas propuestas que salen de la solidaridad para que a nuestros médicos se le otorgue el premio Nobel de la Paz. De todas formas, yo creo que ese premio Nobel, nuestro personal de la salud ya lo logró y el solo hecho de que ustedes lo hayan pensado, el solo hecho de que otros países también se hayan sumado, esa cantidad de personas que en el mundo han recibido el cariño, la atención médica, los servicios que prestan nuestros trabajadores de la salud, yo creo que es el mayor premio que pueda tener nuestros médicos, que además nos lo pidieron, que es precisamente esa solidaridad y ese reconocimiento a ese papel que ellos han desempeñado, que ha hecho que se cree este movimiento en el mundo. Así que en nombre de cuatro millones de mujeres, que es lo que representamos, agradecemos esa solidaridad y le pedimos que confíen en nosotros, que confíen en la fuerza de las mujeres cubanas, en la lealtad a nuestro sistema,
nosotras respetamos y somos leales, fieles a este sistema político que es el que ha logrado que la posición y la condición de las mujeres haya cambiado en la sociedad cubana. Un abrazo, un beso de todas las mujeres cubanas y les decimos que aquí estaremos siempre en defensa de la igualdad de derechos y oportunidades de las mujeres. Thank you so much, um, uh, Teresa, for, and thank you to the FMC for that message. It's clear that Cuba has gained so much strength from uh, the women of Cuba, as well as giving so much strength to the women of Cuba. It's like a circle, and, and it come, that comes clearly through that message that we've just received. Um, although representatives from the FMC are not able to join us on Zoom, I know that we, because we've been uh, live broadcasting this meeting to them on YouTube, they are watching from Cuba now. So once again, congratulations and solidarity from us all. We have 180 people watching across both YouTube and Zoom. Um, and Dania and Gretel from FMC are watching. And we do send our solidarity and uh, greetings to you and wish you and congratulations and um, best wishes to you on this uh, on the upcoming anniversary. And thank you so much, Trace, for that message that you have sent us. Um, our second speaker tonight is Medea Benjamin, who's joining us live from Washington, DC in the US. Medea is the co-founder of the US women-led peace group Code Pink and the co-founder of the human rights group uh, Global Exchange. She's been an advocate for social justice for more than 40 years and is the author of three books on Cuba. Code Pink is also coordinating the current international campaign toward the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize to the Cuban medical brigades working in 35 countries around the world to help fight COVID-19. Uh, welcome, Medea. Uh, I think we need, to, oh, yes. we've got you on muted. Yes. Welcome. Yes. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be invited to speak. And I just love Teresa's address. Um, she touched all the points I was going to say. <laughs> uh, it's quite remarkable, the work of the FMC. And uh, maybe I should just give some personal stories about that because I lived in Cuba in the early 80s. Uh, in fact, I got married in Cuba and it was soon after the family code had been passed. And I'll never forget being before the judge uh, and uh, the judge starting reading from the family code about how uh, the husband has to uh, do the housework, do the child care. This is a 50-50 deal that they were getting into and then stopping and looking right in his eyes and, his, and saying, do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> is this sinking in? This is a partnership. It doesn't matter if you're working and she's not or whatever it is. It's a 50-50 deal. And I, I remember how remarkable that was. Um, unfortunately, when you get back to the reality of the home, uh, in my case, for example, his mother was horrified at the idea that he should be doing half the housework. Uh, many of his unenlightened friends were horrified at the idea. Uh, so things have progressed quite a lot over the years um, where Cuban men have become more and more partners in uh, equal partners. Uh, but just like, I don't know, the British society, but certainly here in the United States, uh, there is still what's referred to in Cuba as the doble jornada, uh, the, the double work uh, that women then have to go home and face because uh, um, men in most countries are not doing their fair share. And I think this becomes more evident uh, in coronavirus where uh, the, uh, at least in, in the US, children are at home and there is so much more work to be done by the family. But going back to a minute from my experiences, I did have my first child in Cuba and uh, I was attended to unbelievably by the healthcare system and uh, then had paid pregnancy leave, then had leave whenever um, uh, my child was sick and also had the best daycare that I uh, could imagine. And these kind of things are in addition to a community in Cuba uh, where people just naturally love children and want to help take care of children. I contrast that to having a, my second child back in the United States 
where I was looking around and saying, where is the community? Where is the child care center? Where is the paid leave? Uh, I didn't have any of that. And um, it is remarkable looking at that Cuban healthcare system when you see uh, you in the UK have a, a, a nationalized healthcare system that's being frayed. Um, we in the US have a disastrous, you can't even call it a healthcare system, uh, where we are suffering so much now from coronavirus and don't see any end in sight. Uh, and Cuba is one of the safest places in the world right now, even though there's been a, a very recent spike in coronavirus, I would still prefer to being in Cuba uh, than being where I am now, uh, where we have, uh, where we are feeling a, a tremendous sense of fear and hopelessness. Um, the Cuban healthcare system runs on a fraction of the cost that we spend on our healthcare systems uh, in the uh, European countries and in the US, uh, and yet has a healthcare statistics that are comparable, if not better, uh, than in our countries. Uh, it is one of the most safest places to give birth because of the very low uh, maternal mortality. Very, uh, it's one of the safest places to be a child because of the very low infant mortality, child mortality, uh, the very low level of violence. Um, and uh, you don't have the problem in Cuba of the uh, kind of um, uh, a violent gun society where children are being killed all the time in our societies. Uh, and you also have a life expectancy that is quite remarkable given how poor a country and financial resources it is. Uh, 77 uh, years for average and going close to 79 years for uh, Cuban women. So um, it is remarkable what an educational system that is free for all and a healthcare system uh, that is universal is able to do in terms of bettering the lives of uh, women in Cuba. Uh, just as the, um, as uh, Teresa from the FMC had talked about, um, there are hardships, uh, many of them caused by the embargo and I'll go back to that, but recognizing there are hardships living in a poor Caribbean island. There are hardships of mistakes that the government makes. There are hardships of uh, mother nature that has uh, devastated Cuba with hurricanes over the years. There are hardships with uh, things like uh, dengue fever and uh, now coronavirus. Uh, and um, these shortages have made life uh, difficult for women in many ways. The shortages of food and medicine, meaning that women have to stand on long lines, uh, that there are uh, difficulties in transportation, difficulties in uh, housing, uh, and um, uh, living in the United States, I do want to spend a moment talking about the embargo because it is a uh, wave so heavy on the hearts of those who care about Cuba to know that our government is causing this kind of hardship uh, for the Cuban people. There was so much hope under the Obama administration when relations were restored, uh, when we could go to Cuba um, uh, without facing penalties, uh, and when the Cuban people thought that this would help alleviate uh, the most recent crisis that came with the uh, lack of um, the government of Venezuela to keep supporting Cuba to the level that it had been uh, because of the drop in the price of oil. And so when Trump came in and uh, turned all of this around, uh, it has been so difficult to see this um, uh, reflected in Cuba and to know in the United States, the reason is the, uh, the uh, US politics where it's an election year, where Florida is an important state, where the Cuban Americans, even though the, it's the older generation that doesn't reflect the younger generation anymore, they still have tremendous power and they are able to run Cuba policy. We see how Bernie Sanders was attacked for saying uh, that Cuba has a good healthcare system. We see that the Congresswoman Karen Bass uh, was probably taken off the list for being a, a vice president, vice president uh, because she had uh, in the past said positive things and expressed condolences when Fidel Castro was killed. I mean, this uh, uh, died, sorry. Uh, this is absolutely insane that such a small group uh, can run U.S. policy towards Cuba and have 
repercussions on the national scale, but it only means that we in the United States have to work harder, get more organized and be more effective in confronting this small group of right-wing Cuban Americans. On the positive side, I wanna say that there is now a new group that's been formed uh, called ASERE um, that is uh, calling for establishing uh, relations of respect with Cuba. And uh, we have now over a hundred organizations that have uh, signed on to the first thing we did, which was to uh, support amendments that would ease the restrictions on food and medicine and uh, support an amendment that would lift the restrictions on the amount of money that Cuban Americans can send to their relatives back in Cuba. Um, we look forward to building this group Asede to be stronger and uh, to get more of the Congress people to be forced to speak up uh, during this pandemic to recognize how cruel it is uh, to be causing this additional hardship on the Cuban people. And finally, I want to echo what uh, Teresa mentioned about the Nobel Peace Prize, because I'm one of the uh, two co-founders, uh, co-chairs in the US um, of the uh, effort to nominate Cuba for the 2021 Peace Prize. We would love for you to go to the website. It's cubanobel.org. Uh, sign up if you haven't signed already and help us to get a lot more than the 30,000 people we have signed up already. Uh, and um, as Teresa said, it's also just horrific to see how the um, US government and even groups like Human Rights Watch are uh, discrediting that beautiful, beautiful program of sending doctors around the world to help fight coronavirus by calling this a program of human trafficking and saying that it's a modern day form of slavery. This is so absolutely disgusting. They say because the doctors don't get their full salaries and they have restrictions on what they can do when they're in those countries, uh, that means that it's a form of slavery. Uh, we know that the portion of the salary that goes to the Cuban government is going to support the healthcare system and Cuban uh, doctors are so proud they can do that. We know they also uh, do this out of altruism because they care about the world and they're putting their lives at risk uh, to help others. So it is really just awful uh, to hear the kind of uh, sabotage that the US has been doing against this campaign. And it's all the more reason that we have to build up this effort um, to show what a small um, resource poor country can do to show the rest of the world what we could be doing if we put our resources towards helping people around the world, towards cooperating, uh, and showing what international solidarity looks like. So thank you very much. Again, congratulations to the Federation of Cuban Women for your incredible work over 60 years and the example that you show for women around the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Medea. And uh, just to say that details of the Nobel campaign are on the Cuba Solidarity Campaign website. Um, and CSC are an endorser of that campaign. And we are collecting messages of support, uh, messages from supporters in Parliament and the British Trade Union Movement, uh, which we'll be posting over the coming weeks. Um, please do sign the Nobel petition, as Medea said, and share details of it with people you know to get as many signatories for that as possible. Um, and also, if you haven't already, sign the CSE petition uh, to the British government um, around asking them to pressure the US to suspend the blockade to allow medical supplies into Cuba to help uh, fight the coronavirus at home as well. So uh, just to echo all those pleas that Medea did um, and to say that all those details are available. Our next speaker is Miriam Palacios. Miriam is a Cuban science researcher and academic based in London. She's a chair of Academic Studies Caribbean Applied Science and Technology, which promotes scientific knowledge sharing between the Caribbean, Britain and Europe. And although Miriam has been based in the UK now, for the last past uh, few years. She is going to give a personal account of her experience growing up in Cuba, joining the FMC shortly after it was established. And she's also gonna talk about her experience of being a scientist in Cuba and in the UK. Uh, welcome Miriam, 
and uh, we're looking forward to that. Thank you. Okay, can, can you hear me? We can. Good evening, comrades and friends of Cuba, Cuba Solidarity Campaign and comrades in Cuba. Thank you for this opportunity for sharing unforgettable time in my life at the beginning of the revolution. I was, I am old enough to remember the sense of freedom, the sense of change in my town in January 1959, when Fidel Castro and the Revolutionary Army crossed the town in the way to the central Havana. And uh, what I couldn't imagine in that time is what was expecting for the women in the revolution. I just saw the moment, the euphoria of people for change and freedom. And um, later on, um, I was aware of the Federation of, women, of Cuban Women because the first and all subsequent meetings took place in my house. Even when I was uh, not old enough to be a member of the MRMC, they allowed me to be part of the meeting. And little by little, they gave me small uh, tasks like reading materials, educational materials in the meetings, taking messages for the houses of the women for the next meeting, sometimes collecting money, different things that although I, I was on the age, I felt part of the organization and they nurtured me. That later on allowed me to get one of the most important moments of my life and I own to the Federation of Cuban uh, Women to be part or, or was part of that movement for a literacy campaign. And I want to share with you the medal I received later for that moment in my life. Um, today, reflecting on how those days in, in the beginning of the Federation of the Cuban Women, um, I discovered that those white women in my, in, in my neighborhood that uh, I never saw outside their home went to the meeting with strong voices, with enormous idea, with an enormous enthusiasm for transformation, for, for being part of something big in society. And today, reflecting on that, it could easy in that time went to the wrong way if they didn't exist the mechanism to link and articulate that movement to harness that energy and infinite enthusiasm to deliver the, the task that the revolution needs and then feedback of the achievement that the Federation of Women uh, uh, got for the revolution. For instance, and I will say one of the first was the national campaign for the vaccination against polio in 1961, that Cuba became in 1962, the first country in Latin America free of poliomyelitis. And that was the big success that women themselves felt proud of that. And at those days, I was one of the children that took the vaccine, that was a little candy that we took, took and be part of, of that. And I, I worked with the F, uh, FS, FMC as the target population, the children that received the vaccine, but at the same time, helping them in that organization. Um, As I said before, one of the big points in my life was uh, being allowed or, or an on to the Federation of, of Women, uh, in the Cuban women, to be part of that movement was the, the Campaña de Alfabetización or the, what we recognize here, the um, Campaign of Literacy. And, the women, uh, uh, Cuban Women Federation, they recognize 
two important principles in that campaign. First, if the literacy exists, do two literacy workers exist? Also, if, if, if the, the one who knows more should teach those who know less. And these two principles were enough to allow me, with nine years old, be part of the uh, community brigade to, to, to teach the workers in, in San Francisco de Paula that were building um, a supermarket. Because literacy in Cuba was very high and was not only in the rural of Cuba. All my cousins in those days that were in secondary school participate in the campaign in the countryside. But I was not allowed because I was not in secondary school. But enough, and I have proof already by my readings in the, in the meeting, that I was able to have the discipline to, and commitment to, this, to do this task. Remembering the, the word of Fidel in December 22nd, 1961, is what made me the next big moment of my life. And his word in part of the speech was, onward come rates, onward to new goals, to meet new commitments, to train as a technician, doctors, teachers, engineers, and revolutionary intellectuals. That was in 1961. The, after that, I became full member of the FMC, member of the Committee of the Defensa de la Revolución, CDR, Committee for the Defense of the Revolution, a member of the Union of the Communist Party. I got a scholarship, a study in secondary school, and in 1975, I graduated from the University of Havana and became my first step, step towards scientists. And again, was the solidarity of, of the women at work, united by the solidarity of the Federation of Cuban Women, who found a place for my child, because at that time I was a mother, to be in one of those nursery for children, then I can join the research group led by a foreign expert and then contribute with my effort to uh, advance the pharmaceutical industry, who was where was the place I, I had my first job. But the life in my uh, institution of my work was a new place of learning, mainly women uh, that work looking after uh, laboratory animals. And those women came from different sectors. We were the first promotion of, of high educated to be part of that laboratory. And uh, what we organized in collaboration with the union and, and was a system in which those that achieve higher education would pass knowledge and at the same time we receive the, the wisdom of those uh, workers that were before, some of them servants, domestic servants, some of them were peasants in the countryside, but then the, the experience, the rich experience of their life before revolution was um, appreciated by us and the less we can do was to build their capacity to improve their skills by which they also have increase in their salary. Then I, I was in an environment surrounded by women leaders that were guiding me and at the same time making me uh, um, aware of my responsibility in society. Then I become a scientist and um, went to this um, devoted life of working long hours in science, as everybody knows. But um, 
my experience in here from 1994 to 2011, unfortunately, unfortunately was very different than what I had in Cuba. I was always surrounded by leaders in Cuba, women leaders that uh, helped me to grow and help me to improve my career. I ha have also the support of my mother who was a very revolutionary woman who looked after my children when I need to go abroad for short training. And every time I came back from those training, I passed to the community of, of my work and um, even to a bigger community outside of my work, the knowledge I learned in those short-term uh, trainings abroad. That build, and I am sure from the word of Teresa, is the strength that is still is alive in the Cuban uh, society. The, the resistance, the, the, the commitment to the principles we are very clear the, the desire to do everything to take forward our revolution and to pass that knowledge to all others, to other countries, to other developing countries. The reality here was different. I found that there was not an environment of female leaders and there was no program as I had in Cuba to further your development in science. And um, of course, I could be maybe the very small environment where I used to live, work, which was University College London. But maybe it's not in, in, in other places. But if I look, um, how is women scientists represented in the um, position of science in this country, we find that the two different approach, the Cuban and the British, reach different results. We have very small representation of women in, for instance, in the Royal Society, while in Cuba, there the, is a big representation of women in the Cuban Academy of Science. And I, I th that is something just very quickly that you see the consequence of a, 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 a process growing, growing and, and building the confidence of women that we are equal in science, we are equal in the discoveries of things, and we are devoted to the effort that science requires. However, maybe since, because I worked at UCL until 2011, uh, and, and maybe things have changed. Uh, now, I, I really was very happy when I realized that a young professor at UCL, um, Rebecca Chipley, is vice dean of the Faculty of uh, Mechanical Engineering and is also the director of the Center of Healthcare and Engineer. She's a woman, she's a mother, and, and I, I am proud that this happened and maybe it's more to come. Maybe it's a revolution coming through Britain. Um, but um, it, it's sad because that support is needed. I, I have to work. I think that I have given to other women what I received from all these older women in Cuba. Um, I help, I encourage a student of PhD here, women to continue to, to think that doing the PhD is not a step for them later going and do nothing. And, and I think um, that is doing what the FMSA did for me. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you, Miriam. That was really interesting and really fascinating to hear. Um, your personal testimony from your journey and to hear the influence of the many women that you met um, and the early days of the FMC and the impact that it's had on your life. And uh, I think we can all learn a lot, not clearly you've learned a lot, but we can all learn a lot as well. Um, and you talked about the literacy campaign and um, 
we're actually going to now show a short film on that that looks at the the impact of that the literacy brigade brigades and the impact it had on women's lives in Cuba. Um, I, I know many of us and, and many of you will know about the, uh, the that campaign and the hundred thousand volunteers that helped the country eradicate uh, illiteracy within one year with over 50% uh, of those volunteers being very uh, young women whose participation in those brigades had a really liberating um, effect as Miriam talked about and many returned empowered with a new sense of confidence and self-esteem. Um, there is a great film about this called Maestro which we're going to show just a three minute clip from now um, and as you're watching it you can sort of match it to what Miriam was talking about. So enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Aurelia Hernández Aide Muñoz y la que les habla, Daisy Veintilla. Bueno, yo estudiaba en el preuniversitario y entonces me enteré, hicieron un llamado por la AJR que empezaba en ese momento, que quien le interesaba ir a alfabetizar a, a, la, a, la zona, a las regiones orientales. Y me anoté en una planilla y me llamaron enseguida. Fui el primer llamado, los primeros que fueron a alfabetizar, el primer llamado. Trabajar en Manatí. En Manatí, en lo que es el, el central de Argelia Libre. Pero de Manatí, en una pobreza grande, cañera grandísima, que había muchas personas que eran alfabetos, bastantes personas. A mí se sirvió mucho porque me creó, me subió, me elevó mucho el autoestima mío personal, ¿no? que eso es muy importante, muy importante en la vida. también, aunque era más chiquita que yo, alfabetizar. Mi papá era sastre, mi mamá modista, que quería haber sido eh, bioquímica, me gustaban hacer los experimentos, siempre estaba experimentando con pomitos y cosas. Eh, ellos me decían que no podía soñar de esa manera porque ellos no tenían posibilidad de costearme esos estudios. Era mi primera salida de la casa, era mi primera sensación de un tanto de libertad, es decir, lo cual hacía que sintiera una manera de vivir diferente. Y le empecé a coger amor a esa especie de independencia. La ubicación fue en la finca Lespoa, en Aguacate, muy cerca de Ramón de las Yaguas, que es ir a ir a una casa alfabetizar un señor llamado José María, que no sabía nada, nada, y me llevé esa satisfacción de lograr en un tiempo eh, que él pusiera su nombre, que conociera um, las letras, que es esa emoción ¿no? de ver un logro de un trabajo eh, interesante poco tiempo. Y estábamos ahí con ese lápiz grande, agarrado, que fue como se desfiló en La Habana, en la Plaza de la Revolución, que desfilamos con un lápiz eh, eh, como mostrando el triunfo de la enseñanza y fue una, un evento de una fuerza enorme, ¿no? porque éramos tantas mujeres y hombres alfabetizadores, jóvenes, todos, que me quedó ¿no? ese recuerdo. Me quedan años y que suceda alguna otra cosa, pero hasta hoy, en mi reciente 58 años cumplido el 22 de mayo, no tengo otra cosa con una fuerza tan grande como esa para 
y que me evoque a su vez cuando comienzo a hablar de ella me evoca para la historia de mi vida las cosas más importantes que he realizado say watching that film e even the short clip of it again is uh, brings back such good memories of going to visit the museum of literacy in havana um you can watch the whole of the film if you it's available uh, on the ces from csc and details of it on the website i was lucky enough to go and visit the uh, museum on one of the delegations that i when i went with the national education union um, with uh, Cuba Solidarity in, nine, in, 19, in 2017 um, and uh, it was a real treat and as a teacher to go there it just I just uh, I'm almost speechless with what it gave us as a group of teachers to feel that and our next speaker is also a member of one of those delegations who's been and I know that all of us who've been on those delegations come back uh, fired up with so much enthusiasm and inspiration to come back. And I think we all want to change the world. So I'm sure that Julie Walters Nisbet is going to tell you about how she would like to change the world after the women that she has met there. Welcome, Julie. Julie, I think we need to unmute you. Yes, sir. there you go. Thank you. Good evening. Um, like you said, that clip brought back lots of memories. Um, and like you said, Philippa, I think it was one of the best um, CPDs I've ever been on as a teacher since starting my career quite early on. Um, we visited, I was part of the delegation that visited Cuba in October 2018. And what really struck me um, and some of my colleagues here in Leicester is that most of the school leadership we encountered in Cuba was black female leadership, okay? They were passionate, they were vibrant, they were expressive, not just in their speech, but in the way that they dressed. Um, none of this gray suit business that we have here in the UK. Um, the leadership, they were leaders. The women were leaders in the primary schools, in the secondary schools, in the special needs schools, in the music schools, and in the universities. Over the last few months during the COVID pandemic, um, here in the UK, we've also seen um, an increase in the awareness of the issues surrounding black people here in the UK and black teachers and black nurses. And one of the programmes that I watched on the BBC two weeks ago said only 1% of leadership in schools here in the UK are black staff. And that really resonated with me in contrast to the experience that we saw in Cuba. Over the last two years since visiting Cuba, myself and my colleagues, you know, we experienced these daily microaggressions, the sort of institutional racism, and then being a female of a certain age, there also comes ageism, okay? So whilst on the trip, um, quite a senior member in the NEU exec said to us, what you're talking about, ladies, it sounds like constructive dismissal. And I'd never heard that terminology before um, until we were on the trip. And, you know, when we started sharing our collective experience, we realized, yes, that's what it was. Women over the age of 40, um, I know one of your speakers talked about childcare being so freely given in Cuba. And I remember us asking the parents in the special needs schools, how do you get time to come in for the reviews? Because they're encouraged to come in at least once a week to talk about targets for their young people with the teachers. And they looked at us like we were gone mad because obviously it was time to spend on their children's education and the expectation was that their employers would support that time to spend on their children's education which we as teachers quite often find it really hard to get out of schools to be involved um, in our own children's education 
So whilst we had this sort of utopic experience um, in Cuba, where we saw, you know, black teachers excelling in leadership, we saw black staff in everywhere we went, including the um, FDC, it was a real contrast for us. And in this particular delegation in October 2018, there were 10 black staff, okay, two of which were male and eight of which were female. In keeping in touch since we've come back to the UK, um, four out of my eight female colleagues have literally been fighting to keep their jobs through multiple observations, work scrutinies, refusal of CPD, restructures. And again, the striking contrast really hits home. In Cuba, what we experienced was that the mature female and mature male staff were encouraged to stay on in schools, to mentor young staff joining the profession, and also to be in, involved in the um, national re-evaluation of the curriculum, which seemed to occur every three to four years. So that experience was really valued and, you know, not degraded because they didn't necessarily have as much physical strength as they did when they started teaching. Um, Pre-COVID-19 in March this, this year, teaching was feeling like a little bit of a disrespected profession here in the UK. And approximately 400 teachers per month were leaving the profession. Lots of those black staff who no longer had the good fight left in them. I'm hoping that one good thing that will come out of this pandemic and the huge amounts of homeschooling that's been going on across the country is that there will be a renewed respect for teachers in the profession and the roles that they support in school in terms of young people's education and development. Here in Leicester, we have tried to mimic what we saw in Cuba. We have a Black Teachers Association within our local branch of the Leicester City NEU. We organise theatre trips and comedy trips and things to help people with their health and well-being. And our wider um, associates in East Midlands have actually got a health and well-being event coming up next Saturday afternoon to help teachers to prepare mentally and physically for the return to school. So I am hoping that if nothing else, from our Cuba delegation, we learnt about how women support one another, whether that's um, with their home environments, with their CPD, with their research, especially during this COVID time where we were, we sort of were passing advice from one another about, you know, as an ethnic minority, I need to be taking vitamin D supplements. They've said that will help us in the, in the prevention and in the immunity against COVID. So I'm hoping that as we go forward, we find some renewed respect for teaching, for black staff in schools and the microaggressions that they've been experiencing. I was recently watching a documentary on Channel 4 and it was about the experience of black nurses here in the UK who'd largely come from the West Indies in the 1950s and 60s. And I said to my colleague, she was WhatsApping me at the time, if I close my eyes, I can hear black teachers speaking. The lack of promotion, the lack of professional development, working extra hard to meet that same pay grade. So I want to congratulate um, the Federation of Women in Cuba. What we saw was truly inspirational. It renewed us, okay, renewed our belief in the system of education. We saw how happy the young people were to learn, and we saw the strength of the girls right the way up through the um, senior leadership in the Federation. And I therefore want to congratulate them on their anniversary. Thank you, um, Julie. Um, Julie's also taking uh, on leadership roles in the uh, union as well, because she is the uh, Vice President of Leicester District, NEU. So she's taking on both leadership in, in the union as well, which is an important thing to do. Um, and she is one of the co-authors of a chapter, and this is the book, a book about um, uh, the, the experiences of people who've been on the delegation beyond the blockade 
and uh, you can get copies of this through the uh, CSC website. So uh, lots of inf interesting information through that. And uh, congratulations on the, the work that you've done through this book as well, Julie. Um, and thank you very much for that contribution. Um, so our final speaker tonight is Elaine Smith, who's joining us from Scotland. Elaine has been a member of the Scottish Parliament for the Labour Party since 1999. Um, she's the convener of the Cross Party Group on Cuba and has been the Deputy Presiding Officer, Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Eradication of Poverty and Inequality, and is currently Business Manager in charge of the WIPS office. Uh, welcome, Elaine, and thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks very much, Philippa, and uh, good evening, comrades and sisters. I'm very pleased to have been asked to address uh, the meeting tonight to mark the 60th anniversary of the Federation of Cuban Women, which will be coming up on the 23rd of August. Um, it's an important event, I think, to help raise awareness of Cuban issues in general, but obviously more specifically those impacting on women. And it also allows us to draw comparisons with women in Scotland and Britain and women in Cuba, and that's what I would like to address much of my remarks too. Um, but it also helps us to foster alliances and come together in an atmosphere of solidarity with our Cuban sisters. So I want to thank Cuba, Solid the Cuba Solidarity Campaign um, for organising it and for everyone who's joined the event this evening. Um, it's unfortunate, of course, that women from the FMC can't join us because of the cruel US blockade preventing them from accessing Zoom meetings, but um, it's great that we had a pre-recorded message from Teresa. And as we're broadcasting live on YouTube, um, could I just send greetings, solidarity and congratulations from Scotland via that medium. Um, and I've also put down a motion in the Scottish Parliament to celebrate the anniversary. And I think that's been put up on the Facebook page as well. Um, so... You mentioned that I was the convener of the cross-party group and I first joined that cross-party group when it was set up uh, in the first session of the Scottish Parliament and I've now been the convener of it for 17 years. I was elected to Parliament in 1999 and that followed a concerted effort by the Scottish Labour Party to increase women's representation. What we did was a system of twinning constituencies and at the end of that, after the election, Labour had 50-50 women's representation and I have to say that I very much doubt if I would have been an MSP if Labour hadn't taken those steps to have that uh, twinning process. My motivation for putting myself forward for election as a socialist at that time was firmly rooted in a desire to see more women in our parliaments. And when I was interviewed by the party as a potential candidate, I recall the words that I began my pitch with and they were... In 1918, the suffragettes won votes for women. 80 years later, 82% of MPs are men. Now, I don't recall the rest of the speech in detail, but I know I went on to argue strongly the need to see an increase in women parliamentarians. So following the election results in 99, the Scottish Parliament had 37% women. That was the third best in the world at that time. And I recall that Cuba was 13th because I often did those comparisons. Um, but what was remarkable was that in that one day, in 1999, we elected more women to the Scottish Parliament than had been elected to represent Scotland in the House of Commons since 1918. So the whole, in, in one day, in total, more than had been elected to the House of Commons at that time. But unfortunately, we have since struggled to advance towards true parity of representation. Scotland is now in 34th place with 36% women, slightly better than the UK, currently at 32% and in 38th place. Um, however, they seem to have dramatically improved while Holyrood has dramatically decreased. Um, and Cuba, of course, now has the second highest percentage of women parliamentarians in the world, 53.2%. So quite a remarkable turnaround from 1999 with those comparisons. Um, in the Council of State in Cuba, it's 45% compared to 26% in the UK cabinet. And the cabinet in Scotland is slightly better off with over 50% women, but worryingly only 28% of the special advisors are women. And it is they who drive government policy and priorities. So that is an issue. 
In Cuba, at the provincial assembly level, it's just over 48% representation of women. And in the local authorities councils in Scotland and the UK, we have 33% in the UK and only 29% in Scotland. When we look at the Cuban women who preside over 10 of the country's 15 provincial assemblies and occupy the vice presidency in seven of them, then we can see, I think, that we clearly need to refocus on strategies for greater women's participation and representation in Scotland and in the UK. And there's no doubt that these electoral achievements um, in Cuba can be traced back to the legacy of the policies introduced in the early days of the revolution, but importantly thereafter, the hard work of the FMC. Women's equality was and is at the heart of the revolution and the establishment of the FMC in 1960, I think very much showed a commitment to this. Of course, increasing women's representation is not just for its own sake, but it's because a critical mass of women in parliaments particularly can make a practical difference through the policies and the laws that improve women's lives. So, for example, in Scotland, in the early years of our parliament, we focused on violence against women and girls, and that resulted in policies to tackle it. And the spectrum of violence included domestic abuse and also issues such as pornography and prostitution. Um, we also had other laws and policies primarily aimed at women. My own breastfeeding bill, for example, to protect mothers and babies' right to breastfeed in public, became law in 2005, and I am quite sure that that would have had little chance of success in a parliament without a critical mass of women members. My current proposed bill on the right to food has women at its heart because we've seen uh, very much in focus recently how austerity and hunger always hits women the hardest. In Cuba, there's been many achievements in relation to government commitment to women's welfare and spending on health and education, which have had a major impact on indicators for women. And uh, Medea mentioned some of these in, in her speech at the very beginning of this meeting. And some of the examples that we have are Save the Children, who consistently placed Cuba first among developing countries for the well-being of mothers and children. The Overseas Development Institute rates Cuba in the top 20 nations for its progress on Millennium Development Goals. The World Economic Forum in the 2020 Global Gender Gap Report ranked Cuba 31st out of 151 countries. And Cuba has 0.02 maternal mortality rate, which is the lowest in Latin America, in over 80 years life expectancy for women, and that's higher than the US. It's undoubtedly the impact of a government which committed to investing in health and education, which makes such a huge impact in women's lives. And Cuba has the highest government spending on social services in Latin America, with the government spending 51% of its national budget on education, health and social welfare. There are also constitutional commitments to free education and healthcare, which we know, and these were cornerstones in the effort to build a more equal society after the revolution. And according to Save the Children's State of the World's Mothers report, and I quote, educating girls is the most effective means of improving the well-being of women and children. And we heard Teresa at the start uh, talking about that issue. So uh, education and literacy also are the foundation of running successful mm. public health campaigns. And although health achievements benefit all Cubans, many of the country's acclaimed policies are specifically directed at women, including on maternal infant care, detection of cervical cancer and family doctors and nurse programmes. And that system, along with uh, Cuba's other social policies, has produced really good strides in maternal and child health. Um, if you look at the healthcare system, the rates of infant mortality has been lowered to four in every 1,000. That's lower than Canada, the US and Mexico. And on that, Scotland is in a slightly better pos position than Cuba, but considering the difference in wealth, then that's not surprising. But it might be of interest to note the degree of health inequality in Scotland, which exists despite our good position in world rankings. So the challenge, I think, for us here in Scotland is the inequalities in life expectancy and quality of life. And these have started to widen again, even before the pandemic. So, for example, there's more than 20 years difference in life expectancy between more affluent and more deprived parts of Scotland. So in the West End of Glasgow, more affluent area, it's 83 for women. And in the East End, it's 72. And that really is a shocking difference. Um, a commitment to sex equality, of course, is guaranteed in Cuba's constitution and laws. And since 1997, there's been a government plan for the advancement of women. And that means that all ministries have a responsibility to ensure that their policies advance women's equality and well-being and report annually to the FMC on what they've done to meet the plan. 
So I would say it's apparent in Scotland that there is a lack of an overarching strategy for women, and that's often led to individual members of parliament having to propose important legislation for women rather than government itself doing so. We could very much learn from Cuba's example here. Um, and drawing my remarks to a close, I was thinking about the many cross-party group meetings that we'd had over the years, and I think amongst the most memorable was an address uh, by Aleda Guevara in the Scottish Parliament. Also an event at the Festival of Politics where we had speeches, music and importantly rum. And then of course the visit by the delegation from the FMC just over 10 years ago. And unfortunately, as we've heard, uh, the visit this year has been halted by the coronavirus. Um, Chair, I'll be standing down in March, but I really hope that Comrade will reconvene the cross-party group in Cuba in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, one of my regrets is that we never managed because we're not a, a um, we're not the UK Parliament, so we never managed to attract any assistance to get MSPs to Cuba or as part of a wider delegation. And I hope that in future that would be able to happen because I think there's a lot to be learned for women MSPs. Uh, in fact, for all MSPs, but particularly for women, and 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 an actual official visit to Cuba would be really good in doing that. However, we have been really successful over the years in raising issues of the blockade and its impact on, for example, businesses who operate here and want to deal with Cuba. And we recognise the impact that that's had uh, on women who are often the ones who bear the most burden uh, within the homes to deal with shortages and hardships that the blockade brings to all Cuban households. I think women in Britain have much in common with their sisters in Cuba. We all fight for equal rights and equal representation in the corridors of power. And in Britain, uh, women in the labour and trade union movement strive for a society based on social justice, equality and a fairer redistribution of power and wealth, not only here, of course, but worldwide. And I think that aim can be helped by strengthening our links with our Cuban sisters, by rejecting global capitalism and joining in solidarity to call for a world where peace, justice and an end to poverty are the guiding principles for all. As sisters, as friends and comrades, we must pledge our ongoing support for the cause of democracy, human, civil and political rights everywhere in the world and unite to call for an end to oppression and discrimination and exclusion of any kind. So I will just end with solidarity with Cuba and with our sisters in the FMC. Solidarity. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Um, I, I've been told as well that Theresa also talks about women in national and local government positions in the, in the long interview that she did. So if you want to know more about uh, that, go do go look out for the full interview that um, when it appears on you, the YouTube channel later this week, and then it, it will sort of tie in with what you were saying at the beginning of your uh, talk as well, because I think that will be really interesting. And there's also an article on the CSC website about the 60th anniversary, which discusses it, it as well. Uh, before we move to questions, if we have time, I'd, it, I'm really pleased to invite Her Excellency Barbara Montalvo Alvarez, the Cuban ambassador, to say a few words, as I know she's been watching and being part of our event this evening. So uh, you are very, very welcome, and we're very pleased to have you as part of the event this evening, Ambassador. Welcome. Um, are we unmuted? Can we just make sure that we've got you unmuted, Ambassador? There you go. Okay, right now? Yes, you're okay now, yes. <laughs> How can I say? Frankly, when Rob told me about the campaign was organizing this uh, meeting, I, I was sure from the beginning that it would be a, a, a of great interest. But this even exceeded my expectations. Uh, memorable times have been evoked today. Um, sincere thanks for this opportunity to share with all of, of you. I'm grateful that the Cuban Women Federation's anniversary, anniversary is commemorated in this way. You, all of you have been uh, generous in assessing that what the Cuban revolution has done in favor of women. And I know indeed it is not a little, but I want you to know that in Cuba, um, our leaders, our authorities 
the women, we are not completely satisfied because we know that there are new scenarios, new challenges, which must be accompanied by innovative ideas, maybe more ambitious goals for this to become a reality. So this just encourages us to keep going and we cannot stop in our objective. Panelists with experience in gender, poverty, eradication, racial discrimination, and scientific, and scientific work have spoken. We know there cannot be a full emancipation of women if uh, many other rights are not guaranteed and social work um, will not be successful, or at least not be a completely successful if it does not include the rights of women. I was, uh, I was very moved by the testimony of Dr. Miriam Palacios, a professional educated and trained, trained in Cuba who later settled in this country uh, where she lived with her family. But Miriam was part of that percent of the skilled labor force in Cuba quoted in this uh, evening. And in a way, she continues to be. She also represents a Cuban nation and the advances in this field. And like her, there are many other here and around the world, and they are a result of that policy aimed to supporting the, the, the participation uh, of the women in all spheres of political, economic, social, scientific, and cultural life in Cuba. For me, uh, this, uh, this meeting has been a tribute to, to Cuban women. Um, and more than that, a tribute to Fidel, who always defended our rights and worked so hard for making them come through. I remember a phrase by Jose Martí that I would like, I would like to, to quote it today. Marti said, when the cultured and virtuous woman anoints the work with the sweet honey of affection, the work is invisible. Congratulations all of you and many thanks for this beautiful and wonderful moment. Thank you so much and I'm glad you're here to join um, us for this beautiful and wonderful moment. I, I agree it has been a really beautiful and wonderful moment. Um, we are slightly short of time. Um, we have had a couple of questions but I'm going to just <coughs> pick out um, one to start with. I think we will probably only have time for this and um, that the question I'm going to ask, and if each person would like to think about that, is, well, I've sort of disappeared off your screen. I don't quite know how I've managed to disappear off your screen, but I'll keep talking, is, um, uh, is that if, what do you think are the greatest challenges facing Cuban women today? Um, and I will go to each of our, um, our, the, our speakers to think about what they think the greatest challenges facing Cuban women today are. Um, and just, uh, we'll go, uh, could we start with you, Medea? Is that all right? Sure. Well, I think there are- Oh, sorry, are... I'm just going to interrupt you. You've got two <laughs> minutes maximum to answer and I'll have to interrupt you. Know. <laughs> I think there are economic issues and uh, they're related to coronavirus. 
uh, which a survey just showed that women are in Cuba are more <laughs> worried about it than men are. Uh, and it's not just whether they can continue to contain the spread, it's the economic fallout of this. Uh, not having tourism is a major source of revenue. Uh, the attacks on the Cuban doctors overseas and the uh, retraction of thousands of doctors now that there are conservative governments in Brazil, Ecuador, uh, and um, Bolivia uh, has been a major loss of income. Uh, the uh, Venezuelan crisis has uh, been um, reflected in the Cuban economy. And then I think a challenge of whether we're going to have four more years of Trump is going to make a big difference in the lives of Cubans. So uh, those economic challenges, I think, are the um, most critical ones. Thanks, Medea. Um, Julie? Hi, good evening. Um, what do you do when you've got too many female leaders in the same space? Um, my niece-in-law is actually currently studying medicine in Cuba. Um, and because of the vast number of doctors that Cuba is successfully um, educating, the next steps in terms of her postgraduate specialism, etc. cetera, um, they are on current she's currently on a scholarship that was given to other Caribbean islands to study medicine but it's the next steps where do they seek employment after that and as a science teacher you know I can agree that it's magnificent magnificent that so many women are going into STEM but it's where do they seek employment afterwards and whether we here in the UK and other Oh, sorry, and uh, and European countries, not other anymore, can provide some employment for those young, educated female graduates. Thank you. And uh, Elaine. Sorry, thanks, Philippa. Yeah, obviously, um, the, the COVID pandemic is an issue, and poverty and inequality caused by the blockade, which is also an issue in Scotland. We've seen a terrible. Uh, not of the blockade, of course, but we've seen poverty and inequality was rising before COVID, but now the rise in food banks, etc., has been um, has really increased and job losses, and that will impact more on women. But I would like to just say, I think the one thing is making sure that Cuban women hold on to the representation that they have gained and don't take it for granted, because if you look at what happened in the Scottish Parliament in '99, and then you look at where we are now with women's representation. You know, you fight to get it, but you also have to fight to make sure that you keep it. And I think also the double work day that was mentioned earlier on is a challenge for women everywhere where we have uh, paid jobs, but also the main caring responsibilities in the home. Thanks. Thank you very much. And Miriam? Okay, I want one message. And I am asking all the women in Great Britain, in the world, to convey in this fight against the blockade. Uh, we need to, to be a big, massive force in the same way that the Cubans were the 50% injured women of the revolution. We need that in the world. We need to stop the blockade. The United States cannot continue doing what it's doing that is criminal, that is against our family, that is against of, of our children. We can stand that. If we have a sense of what a woman is in life and in our family, we can we can allow Americans to continue the blockade. I don't know what we are going to do, but we have to mobilize the world power of women. Thank you. I like the idea of mobilizing the world power of women. <laughs> and Ambassador, would you like to sum up for us? The main challenge is for women and for all Cuban people, continue. Nothing stop us. Resist, work, advance, despite any aggression. And the end, we shall overcome. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I, I'm. Uh, I. I think, like the rest of the people here in this meeting, and um, those watching on YouTube, we are all um, inspired to continue um, and to mobilise that world power of women to do the things that we need to do. I think whenever you are involved in anything uh, with Cuban women, Cubans and Cuban women, you always learn so much and you come away ready to do the campaigning and the jobs you need to do for social justice, whether it's with the Cubans or whichever social justice campaign you are involved in. So I'd like to thank you myself for what you have given us this evening as well as congratulate you on the anniversary and send solidarity for that. Um, I hope that everybody has enjoyed this evening's meeting as much as I have this, e uh, this, uh, this evening. And uh, it's given a real insight into how Cuban women have been part of that revolutionary process uh, right from the very beginning. Um, and clearly it would not have been nearly as successful if women had not been involved in it. Uh, fighting in the underground movement through to the literacy brigade, shaping the constitution and playing a leading role in all areas of Cuban society. Now, of course, we as ever want to finish our meeting with a call to action. And uh, I want to remind you to sign the petitions for the Nobel Peace Prize and for the US government to cease the blockade uh, to allow medical emergency supplies to reach uh, Cuba. And also, of course, if you are not yet a member of CSC, we would like to ask you to join. Uh, it comes um, as well as making sure that we are uh, in solidarity with the Cubans, our Cuban friends. You also will receive a Cuba C magazine four times a year with updates from Cuba and the work of the campaigns. And there will be full reports of these online meetings too. Uh, this meeting will be available to watch and share on YouTube and CSC will be sharing details with, of that on the website shor shortly. Um, and do keep aware of what's happening in Cuba and future meetings by signing up to our updates um, and by visiting the Cuba Solidarity Campaign website or following them on Facebook or Twitter and uh, if you wish to receive notifications. And if you can to afford to please consider donating to the campaigns to help support the work that we do. Details of all the links will be on the screen at the end of this meeting. So uh, it only the only thing I have left to do is to thank all our speakers tonight and all the viewers that we have on Zoom and YouTube and especially the Federation of Cuban Women for joining us via YouTube and to thank everybody for being part of this. Um, in the uh, film from the Literacy Museum, one of the participants talked about something that she carries with her all the time. And I think uh, that is clear that the work of the Cuban women, they carry it with them all the time because they know how important and what an impact they've had. So uh, taking that message with us, thank you so much for being part of this evening and stay safe, look after yourselves and go um, with solidarity for the Cubans and the work of the women in Cuba. And thank you very much for being part of this meeting this evening. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. All right, y'all, thank you so much for watching that discussion. I learned quite a lot. I hope y'all did too. I did see some folks saying wow multiple times in the comments. So I hope that was like wow of <laughs> education. A oh, wow if I just like learned a thing. Um, but as we said at the beginning, this uh, seminar was presented to y'all by the New Mexico Committee of the Vencianos Brigade. I'm actually the last one standing because my comrades Roberto and Sheldon had to leave um, to address some community issues. So I want to thank you all so much for joining us. We do these political education um, screenings every last Wednesday of the month, which means this will be happening again next month in May. I believe we're going to do a show about Che Guevara, which should be great. 
Also, the Events and MS Brigade is a solidarity delegation to Cuba. We don't just do political education, like Roberta mentioned at the beginning. We also organize trips to Cuba from the United States so that people living in the United States can see the truth about Cuba. Because I guarantee you, if you are a U.S. citizen, if you're a person living in the United States of America, all you've heard about Cuba are lies. And so the intent of the VB is to expose us to the truth, um, to engage in exchange and solidarity building between Cuban people and people living in the United States, um, particularly people who are fighting in social justice movements. Um, the brigade is not happening this year uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, not because of complications in Cuba, but because the United States has failed so utterly to control the spread of COVID-19 that uh, there's no way for us to safely bring people from the United States to Cuba, and we are not trying to spread COVID infections in Cuba just because we want to go there. So the brigade will be back next year. We are still actively organizing it and fundraising. We want to make sure that people who are on the front lines of fights for social justice in the United States are able to attend the trip. And so that means African people, that means indigenous people, that means Chicano people, that means poor and working class people. And when you want to bring uh, historically marginalized folks on an international trip, it means that you are going to have to fundraise. We are not, uh, people are not going to be able to pay out of pocket for that experience. And so we are actively raising funds for people to be able to attend, the people that need that trip the most. So if you are interested in supporting um, African, indigenous, uh, Chicano, poor, working class people, and youth in attending the next Vents and MS Brigade, we encourage you to donate at this link. You can make a one-time donation of any amount, or you can sign up to donate monthly, and all of the money you donate will go towards providing grants for people to attend the next brigade next year, as well as uh, supporting the ongoing work of the Vents and MS Brigade. So again, I want to thank y'all so much for joining us. We'll be back on uh, next month, on the last Wednesday of the month. And also, if you are in Tiwa territory, stay tuned for news about a Cuba Solidarity car caravan that the New Mexico Events and Amos Brigade Committee is organizing all around the world for the past few months on the last Sunday of every single month. Uh, Cuba Solidarity organizations around the world have been organizing these car caravans calling for an end to the U.S. blockade in Cuba. We want to bring that action here to Tiwa Territory, to Albuquerque, so we'll be organizing a car caravan on the last Sunday in May. So please like our page on Facebook if you have not already. That's the New Mexico Vents Demos Brigade Committee, and you will receive all of the updates on when that is happening and how you can participate. So thank you all so much for joining and have a good rest of your day.